Award-winning programming from the Fairfax Network is available at our video store at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network or call 1-800-233-3277. The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. Welcome to Meet the Author. My name is Tracy Jewell and I'm here live at the MTA studio along with some students who have joined us in the audience from Frost Middle School in Fairfax, Virginia and students from McLean High School in McLean, Virginia. And of course our very special guest today is author T.A. Barron. He'll be talking about the writing process, discussing some of his books and maybe telling us a little bit about his most recent travels. Some of T.A. Barron's book titles include The Adventures of Kate series, as well as the Great Tree of Avalon Trilogy, which is listed on the New York Times series bestseller list. But many of you will know my guest through his memorable character of young Merlin and his adventures on the enchanted Isle of Finkyra in the Lost Years of Merlin epic. So welcome to everyone. It's great to have you here. Students, thanks for joining us. And of course, Mr. Barron, thank you for taking time out to join us today. My pleasure. As you can imagine, we've got a lot of questions to come from these students here. But first, we just want to let the students at home know that this is a live presentation at home. You're not at home, right? You're at school. We're going to be opening up our phone lines in just a few minutes. So you can join us in the discussion here by calling our number nationally, which is 1-800-231-6359. If you're calling us locally, you can reach us at 703-978-1636. So, Mr. Barron, a lot of the students here have read numbers of your books. Um, most of them, you've all read at least one, right? At least one of Mr. Barron's books. So, we've got a lot of questions about that. Um, and we're going to get started um, first with Hunter. Why don't you go ahead with your first question? Um, did you always want to be a writer? And how old were you when you first started to write stories? I think I was probably old enough to hold a pen, but <laughs> very young in any case, and I always loved the world of stories. You know, whether it was a campfire tale, I was told at the ranch in Colorado where I grew up, or a, a big, big sprawling novel, or a play, or a Greek myth, or a biography, I've always loved stories. And even when I was in fifth grade, I started my own little magazine that was uh, dedicated to just basically keeping me out of trouble, but it was, it was a, a bizarre, wacky little magazine. So it was just the fun of exploring. It had a, an expose about the secret of what really goes on inside the teacher's lounge, which got me into a little bit of trouble, but <laughs> it was fun. I guess you could say it was my first bestseller. So while we're talking a little bit about your background, um, you have been a traveler all of your life. All my life, ever since uh, growing up on that ranch in Colorado, Tracy, I have loved to travel. And so I came back east to Princeton to college, uh, uh, studied abroad for a while, went to Oxford, and then took a whole year to travel around the world on the Trans-Siberian Railway. Uh, in uh, Japan, I worked as a roof thatcher for a couple of months. Um, worked in Nepal for a trekking company for a while, India the Philippines, Thailand, and eventually Scandinavia, and found my way back to Oxford, England, where I was. And in the course of that, I wrote my first novel, okay. which had a great reception. It got rejected by 42 different publishers <laughs> all inside of one year. So I was off to a wonderful start to be a writer. But there has to be a start, right? It has, there has That's to be a right. beginning. That's right. So let's talk about some of your recent travels. You took a trip to Rwanda. That's right. I just came back last week from uh, tracking mountain gorillas in Rwanda uh, with my daughter, uh, who's uh, a college student now, majoring in anthropology. And we had a fabulous time. It's an incredible experience. I think always travel expands your mind and gives you a sense of the wider world and the way people are very, very similar, even as different as we all are. And it was, as always, good material for future books, mm -hmm. too. So mm -hmm. I met some wonderful people and those incredible, graceful, beautiful creatures and one more thing, when you look at a great big mammal like a gorilla or a whale, eye to eye, it's like you're looking across the span of millions of years of time 
and finding a common connection. It's a really wonderful experience. So should we maybe expect to uh, see Gorillas Incorporated? You in never know. You never Everything's know. Everything's material for a writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, talking a little bit about nature. Um, one of the things that I uh, read about you was you said that there are two things that are always present in your books, heroes and nature. Can you talk a little bit about where that comes from? You know, I think the, the, the first point to remember is that writing is the hardest work I've ever done, and it's also the most joyous work I've ever done. And to find that joy, I think it's important to find your sources of inspiration as a person and as a writer, because writing, after all, is a way to explore the world and the universe and, and while having a good time, ask those big questions that we all want to think about to be thoughtful human beings. And for me, the combination of nature as a source of, of inspiration and healing and, and transformation with the power of every individual to make a difference in the world and the, the fact that all of our choices really matter. Um, when I put those two together, a story bubbles up. Mm -hmm. And those are, so in the stew pot of my stories, those are the two primary ingredients. You'll always find whatever size book, whether it's a big fat novel or one of my small picture books or a nonfiction book, there are always those two qualities. And there's a little bit of nature there in, in the photograph that we're seeing. Uh, That's in fact a picture of a tiny little chameleon I found in Africa and it's going to be on the back of the jacket of my new book as it turns out because the new book is going to be the Merlin's Dragon trilogy, book one. And this is the story of a tiny little lizard who becomes something much greater. All right, so something to look forward to, you guys, for an upcoming series, right? Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, a book that Mr. Barron wrote about heroes a little later in the show. So we'll get back to that topic in just a little bit. Um, but first of all, we're going to move on to talk a little bit about The Lost Years of Merlin, because some of you guys have read that. So uh, let's get our first question from that. Um, but before we do that, actually, let me get you to, if you don't mind, Mr. Barron, give us just an overview of what is that series about. The Lost Years of Merlin is the story of the greatest wizard of all times, Merlin himself, the person we've told stories about for more than, more than 1,500 years, we humanity, but in a different way. Instead of that great, exalted, wonderful old wizard who's the mage of Camelot and the best friend and teacher of King Arthur, this is a story that begins with a boy who washes ashore on the very first page of book one of The Lost Years of Merlin. All you have is this half-drowned, bedraggled, barely alive boy who washes ashore and worse than anything else he's lost all of his memory mm -hmm. so he has no idea who he is where he came from who his parents were and of course no idea that he has this great glorious destiny as the greatest wizard of all times so in the five books of the lost years of Merlin we see him discover his inner magic discover his wisdom and in a way it's a metaphor but from beginning to end of what it takes to become a whole wise human being. Mm -hmm. And at the very end of the very last scene when you see that young man, he's now 17 years old, but he's ready really to step into lore as that great, wonderful, thoughtful, caring wizard that we know, you'll say, wow, he has come a long way from that boy who washed ashore. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's get into some questions about the series. Daniel, let's start with yours. In The Lost Years of Merlin, what inspired you to write this genre of fantasy writing? Sometimes dreams are the best way to talk about reality. And the wonderful thing about Merlin is that all throughout time, people have, I think, gravitated to him because he's such a complex and thoughtful character. He knows human weaknesses. He has plenty of flaws and weaknesses himself, but he also knows our strengths and our ability to reach for the stars, which is part of what makes him ultimately this great mentor to King Arthur. But it also makes him a really interesting character. And then the other side is that Merlin's story is really a chance to talk about humanity's connection with nature because Merlin, after all, was a druid in the ancient Celtic lore. And so I made it all of his greatest lessons come from nature, whether he's caught in a storm at the top of the tree, remember that scene, and he barely holds on for life. And then finally, when the storm vanishes, he's left holding there and he realizes if nature can change so quickly, maybe he can change too. And so whether it's running with the deer or uh, becoming a fish and swimming in the sea or surviving a blizzard, whatever it is, he learns from nature. Okay. 
Good question. We got more questions about this series, Sam. Um, in uh, your book, The Lost Years of Merlin, um, was the story and the characters purely from your imagination? Well, remember there's five books in The Lost Years of Merlin, and then three more in The Great Tree of Avalon. So altogether, there's actually over a hundred characters. And the truth is that all of them come in part from imagination. But the key character, of course, Merlin, no one owns Merlin. I'm just one of the latest long string of writers to write about Merlin. I've tried to give him a new humanity by writing about him when he was your age. But he is still the great Merlin of lore. And what my great hope is, is that in the big tapestry of myth about Merlin that has been woven with these beautiful complex threads and colorful ideas over a hundred, hundreds of years, that this fills in the hole in the tapestry about his youth. But it still has to fit. So you'll see a lot of, I'm doing a lot of foreshadowing about Camelot and the Merlin to come. And at the same time, ha getting the chance to be really original and free and, and have the fun of creativity. All the other characters I made up, <laughs> but I used a lot of Celtic lore to inspire them. Like Merlin's great teacher, the poet Carepre, is someone from an ancient Celtic ballad that I found. His, his friend, I almost revealed who she really is, <laughs> Rhea is actually um, a young woman who I got, I, I, I was inspired by a Celtic poem about a, a, a fiercely strong but very wise young woman named Rhea. The evil Rita Gower actually was an ogre, in, that was the name of an ogre in, an, in a uh, uh, Celtic myth. And so I used Celtic themes to make the tapestry threads feel true because they have to feel true for smart readers like all of you. So while we're talking about Merlin, Moises, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Mr. Barron, uh, why do you like the uh, character Merlin so much? Moises, that's a great question. I, I have to say, Merlin feels just like the coolest character ever written about. He, he, and, and as I said, I'm only one of many who's written about him, but what calls to me about him is that, first of all, he's not perfect. He's not just a cartoon character hero. He makes mistakes, he, he, he forgets things, he does the wrong thing trying to do the right thing. He, he's human, in other words. And at the same time, he grows and learns. And he loves nature, he learns from nature. And finally, one last thing, he's always stood in all the lore about Merlin, he's always stood for universality. The idea that people, no matter how different, really have much more in common. So that's why you'll see Merlin in my books just as easy talking with the great nobles in the court as he is with the peasant on the, on the dusty street, as he is talking with um, the leaders of, of, of uh, great peoples, as he is sitting on the hillside and whistling, and his, his old friend, the gray wolf, comes and sits by his side. So just to follow up on that then, is it, is it a challenge to write about a character that's so well known in folklore? Absolutely. Uh, my challenge with Merlin was to make it true, make those tapestry threads fit, but mm -hmm. also give him real life. I, honestly, my goal was to create a young Merlin in those five books of the Lost Years of Merlin who is every bit as real and alive and eccentric and true and human and vulnerable as the elder Merlin in T.H. White's Once and Future King. That's the goal. You can decide whether I succeed or not. <laughs> okay, well we have a question from Kasha about some of the other characters in the series. Kasha? In the last years of Merlin, why would Gwenya turn on Rhea after all these years of helping her out? The short answer to your wonderful question is that Gwenya really was afraid of dying and wanted to do anything she could to stay alive. And it's a very human kind of feeling to have. And so she did something terribly wrong. Ultimately, she does something to undo that and, and Rhea forgives her. But the real larger answer to your important question is that every character has to have a, a iceberg that's underneath the sea that you don't know about as a reader. As a writer, though, you have to understand all of those qualities that make a character feel real and true. You may just be seeing the tip of the iceberg above the water, but the character has to have fears and doubts, hopes, aspirations, dreams. I always ask myself, what is my character's deepest secret? And when I finally hear them tell me that, it might be the third or fourth or fifth draft before I hear that, in their own voice, 
which might be a little whispery voice. It might be a voice that's in rhyme. It might be a, a deep, gruff voice. It might be something that's a totally different language. It might have its own crazy quirks like Shim the Giant, who speaks in this wonderful way, like a, something like a three and a half year old, and yet he's as hall, tall as a hillside. Whatever their language is, if they tell you their secret, then you know them well enough to make them come alive for readers. So we talk a lot about character development when we're writing, right? You guys know that term. So when you come to the point of developing characters like this, do you do that before you start the novel? Does it happen along the way? Both. That's an excellent question. I actually always begin with a little character sketch of a character. When I was writing my books about Kate, the, th the three novels, The Ancient One, Heartlight, The Merlin Effect, that feature a 12-year-old girl, I realized when I submitted that book, and this one, unlike the first one that got rejected all over the place, this one got accepted the first try, thanks in part to a, a, a recommendation from a wonderful writer, Madeline Lengel, who I've always loved and admired, and, and she sent it to the person who is now my editor and said, check this out. That's, that, that, was a, that was a good beginning, and the editor wrote me back and said, you know what, I would like to publish this book about this girl named Kate. There's only one problem. She is a boy. She's a 12-year-old boy with a braid. And you have to now decide, is she, is she gonna stay a girl in these books and be, be Kate, or is she gonna be a boy, and then in that case, just change her name to Ken or something else. And so I stopped writing, because I really, it was very important to me to write these books with a girl main character. I didn't know if I'd ever write any other books, and, I, and we had only one child at that point, as opposed to the five ch children we have now, um, who is our eldest, who's a, a girl, and, and I wanted to write a book especially for her to give her a sense that she could do anything. And so it was very important to make it a girl. The way I did that, though, was to write a little biography of Kate okay. about all those little things that I was talking about, her fears, her hopes, her dreams, why she loves her grandfather so much, what it is about spiced tea that brings back special memories, what is her darkest fear that she would do anything to avoid thinking about. Yeah. Okay, we have a couple more questions about The Lost Years of Merlin before we talk about some other books, so let's go to Sarah. How did you come up with the idea of a spider that shrinks and then grows? Oh, you know, there is no explanation for where ideas come from in stories. It's part your own imagination, it's part your own experience. If you've if you've traveled as widely as I have, and if you love nature and the diversity of cultures and peoples in the world, ideas come from all over. And so I can't actually tell you where that idea came from, but I do, I do remember feeling that, that that particular character both had to be very frightening and fearful that it would show Merlin's courage, and at the same time, surprising and, and give you a sense that this magical world that he's entered into is not just your normal walk down a street in, in Fairfax County, Virginia. It's something very different. Okay, very good. Let's move on to Matthew. What was your question? What characters are the hardest to create and how do you develop the characters for your novels? The hardest characters to create are characters who are very different from me or my own experience. But that's the joy of writing. One of the joys is that it stretches you. There's no way to get complacent if you're a writer. No matter how good you get, no matter how much you learn, no matter how many different kinds of books you've published, there is always more to learn. And that's both a great challenge and a wonderful thrill. That's what I love about writing. I think more than anything else is it's always stretching me. And always an evolving process, right? It is. <laughs> okay, we've got one last question about this series from Emmeline. Go ahead. Uh, is there a message that you would like the, ri the readers to understand about the lost years of Merlin? Wonderful question, Emmeline. If there's one idea underneath everything else, all the adventures, beyond just wishing every reader of the lost years of Merlin, a, and, and now the new trilogy, the Merlin's Dragon trilogy, where Merlin appears again, and the Great Tree of Avalon, where he pe appears again. When you get to know Merlin, my, my, I, I wish you have a great time, a wonderful page-turning adventure, but underneath it all is the idea that every person, every child, every one of us has some magic down inside of ourselves. Just like that boy who washes ashore on the first page of book one of The Lost Years of Merlin, you may be hopeless, despairing, bedraggled, lost, unsure, and yet, even then, there's something special down inside yourself. And what 
life is about is discovering that, believing in it, and then becoming it. Great message. And a great place for us to just stop and take a breath for a second. We've asked you a lot of questions so far, Mr. Barron, and They're lots great. more to go. So we're going to take just a short break. So everybody hold on to your questions there. And when we return, we'll have more talk with T.A. Barron. But first, it's Right Tracks, writing tips for students and teachers. We'll be right back. Here are some tips from one teacher to another. Have your students incorporate the five senses into their writing. Encourage your students to use figurative language. Encourage children to read challenging books so they will be exposed to rich vocabulary and complex thoughts. This will encourage your students to incorporate these elements into their own writing. These tips will help your students stay on the right track. Meet the author and get the full story. The backstory. You guys are actually the first to know about this. I haven't even told my editor about this idea. The revised story. The author's story. You just do it. You read, you watch, and you write. And sometimes, quite a story. Writing isn't a job. It's a way of looking at the world and meeting new people. Meet the author, a production of the Fairfax Network. Okay, we are back. Thanks for uh, joining us here for Meet the Author. And a reminder, if you have a question for T.A. Barron, you can participate in our discussion, too. We are opening our phone lines. So our number here nationally is 1-800-231-6359. If you're calling us locally, you can reach us at 703-978-1636. And we do actually have a caller right now, Mr. Barron. So, Kira, can you tell us where you're calling from and ask your question? calling from Flint Hill, and does your life relate to any of the characters in your work? Oh, good question. Does your life relate to any of the characters in your work? Great question. You know what the truth is, and this might surprise all of you coming from someone who's written about all these bizarre, enchanted realms of all kinds and descriptions ranging from Finkyra from Merlin to Avalon to my children's book about Easter Island, to all these places, and Merlin's dragon, all of that. But the best material comes from real life. The trick, I think, to being a writer, in part, is noticing real life as you go through it, being as fully aware and alive as you can. Because then, when you take in life that fully and write it down in your journals and make it, make it words, then you really are both giving yourself material and also living a full life. Okay, great question there. Um, let's see, let's, let's go back to uh, Paige for a question about the Great Avalon Tree Trilogy. What inspired you to write the Great, a great Tree of Avalon Trilogy? The Great Tree of Avalon, I knew at the very end of The Lost Years of Merlin, when he, he has to leave this wonderful place that he's saved, he does one last thing in that moment of great triumph, but also poignance, because he has to say goodbye to the people he loves, to the woman he loves, to his best friends. Merlin does one last thing at the end of the Lost Years of Merlin. He plants a seed. Now, it's a magical seed, a seed that beats like a heart in his hand. And he doesn't know what it's going to become. He just knows that this seed that was given to him by someone very special, we won't say who, those of you who've read it, he won't get to see what it is, but he knows that it'll be the most magical thing he has ever touched. And then he leaves. He goes to Camelot. And you know what? At the end of that scene, Merlin wasn't the only one who didn't know what it becomes. I didn't know what it was going to become either. I just knew that the seed would be something marvelous and we could all have the fun of imagining it. Well, three or four years went by. I wrote some different books. I wrote a nonfiction book about heroic young people called The Hero's Trail. And I started to find myself wondering, what did that seed become? And that's when I realized that in the thousand years that had gone by in Merlin's world, that seed had grown into a tree so vast that it stretches from earth to heaven, that it would have seven different realms that would all be built around different elements, and that this would be a tree that was an entire world of its own, whose branches would be pathways up to the stars. And one more thing, that it would be the last place in all the universe where humanity had learned to live together in harmony with our fellow living creatures and the environment that we're in. 
And so that saving this world, because of course it's in trouble at the first page of the, of the Great Tree of Avalon, saving that world that three courageous young people have to do, one of them being the true heir of Merlin, is also about how we learn to save our world here. So in a way, the Great Tree of Avalon is an environmental parable. Good question. Okay, so we're, we're quickly running out of time here, oddly enough. So we, in addition to getting in your questions, we want to make sure we get some email questions in Great. that we've received. So uh, we've got one uh, from Dakota in Arlington, Virginia. And he <laughs> asks, Dear Mr. Barron, do you ever write young adult books that are nonfiction? And I think you just referenced one of them. I do. And, and you know, um, I will say that the best fiction really feels true. And, and, it's, and it's important to be true on the level of the senses and the emotions and also on the level of ideas. But there still is nothing so inspiring as real true stories. And so I decided, frankly, more as a dad of five children than as a writer about five years ago to just stop writing my novels and write a book about heroic kids, young people who've really made a difference to the world, who've found themselves in really difficult times, maybe you could say, who found themselves washed ashore in their own lives in the way that young Merlin does. But just like Merlin, and just like all of you young people out there, they found in themselves great magic and, and wisdom and compassion and especially courage. And they drew on that courage and wisdom to try to help not just themselves, but to save the world in a small way. Not that they wanted to be celebrities, but that they just wanted to help a little bit. Mm. And so this book, The Hero's Trail, is really full of more than 150 stories of young people of all backgrounds, all different kinds. And in fact, I've been so inspired by these kids, I've started a nationwide prize that I give every year 10 scholarship awards to young people of all different backgrounds who win this um, prize. I've named it after my mother, so it's called the Gloria Barron Prize for Young Heroes. And you can read about their inspiring stories on my website if you'd like. Mm -hmm. And we, we are unfortunately running quickly out of time, but just let me let you guys know that you can go to uh, Mr. Barron's website, and there you can get more information about the foundation, about the competition, and then also about a documentary that you've made based on the story. So that's, that's right. We've just produced a new documentary film that you can see um, the trailer of it on my website. Right. And so it's we'll about these kids, and I promise you, their stories will renew your hope so in the So we'll world. encourage you to visit that uh, site and get a lot more information about Mr. Barron. Quick half hour, huh, guys? <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us and taking your time, students, to come in and join, a, join us today. And Mr. Barron, of course, your busy schedule. Thanks for coming in. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So our guest today, again, has been author T.A. Barron. And again, if you'd like to learn more about his books or about other information that we've talked about today, check out his website at www.tabarron.com. And of course, as always, if you'd like to learn more about our upcoming programs, you can visit our website at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Net Network, I'm Tracy Jewell. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming.